morning, everyone. Hi. My name is David Briggs, and I'm happy to see you here tonight. I was fiddling with this TV because in March I did this presentation for about 70 people at the Hotel Coolidge in the Vermont room, just the right spot for it, and uh, was recorded and wonderfully edited by the people from JAM who are recording this again tonight, so I thank them for that. And uh, Peggy and I went back and looked at what I had done through their um, edited copy the other night, and I said, I can't do any better than that. <laughs> so I was going to spring the first 50 minutes of my remarks the other night on you and then turn it over to Q&A. So I couldn't make it talk to this TV that I spirited out of my house just now, as you could see. And I think that maybe Judy Barwood and I were separated at birth because she's acting like my sister when she came up and said, you know, it's 7 o'clock. <laughs> I did know that. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm going to go through these slides tonight based on my knowledge of them, because I put them together. And this will be a slightly different rendition. I will make sure that through Scott Fletcher's wonderful newsletters and other resources, you get a link to the original one, and you can watch that and call out all the inconsistencies or whatever you want to do. Um, so this is the story of the Coolidge block in my own perspective. And so I'm going to take you through it uh, in fairly clipped fashion to get to a Q&A, because I'm really eager to have you drill me on questions. Um, this is an ambitious thing that I'm talking about tonight. It's complicated. It really calls for a lot of cooperation and enthusiasm. And I need the challenge from you. And it's sort of like at the end of the day, when you shoot the questions you may shoot at me, and I'm still standing, then I'm going to keep going. So give me your best shot, OK? Um, let's see how we do here. Anybody recognize this name? Nobody? Yes. Judy does. <laughs> You're right there with me, Judy. You're on my shoulder. Um, so this has to do with the notion of two things. First of all, that kids are like sponges. They pick up on things. And they certainly pick up on them from teachers and parents at a really young age. And you're kind of amazed when you think back at what you did pick up and what mattered, what's meaningful, and all of that. And um, I consider myself to be a preservationist. And I want to underscore that because I'm advocating for tearing down a historic building in a historic, business, in a historic district. So the what's up with that, of course, prevails. Um, Miss Lucille Scully was my first grade teacher back in the day when we went to what's now called the municipal building or the town hall. And um, uh, that was in 1952. And uh, just small world version of this. In 1928, she was my dad's first first grade teacher. That's only 24 years apart, so that, that can happen. Teachers last a lot longer than that. In fact, she, my sister and brother had her as well. Um, so she imprinted the notion of the importance of historic preservation, lamenting the passing of notable structures in the village. And I want to say one thing about her. Uh, from a sociological standpoint. Years later, when the women's lib movement came around, I was a little perplexed because my impression with my mother, who many of you knew, and people like Miss Scully, I thought, do we need this? These women are terribly well together, put well together and strong and confident. And she would, she weighed about 102 and she'd push her piano from one side of the room to the other without any union workers to help her. You know what I mean. And, uh, and she advanced all kinds of good things. Um, one of the things that she told us about was the passing in 1930 of this building called the Lyman Homestead. How many of you are familiar with the Lyman family name? Uh, Elias Lyman ran and owned a toll bridge across the, White, uh, the Connecticut River going where it does now over to um, Four Aces. It's called the Lyman Bridge. 
strangely enough, our other bridge is the Lehman Bridge. So you got to know what you're talking about. Anyway, this building was turned, uh, torn down in 1930 in favor of a gas station. <laughs> it was Timmins Golf Station for many of us when we were kids. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, eventually, uh, the gas station became a building put up by Marble Bank some time ago. Another prominent building in downtown was the Smith Chocolate Factory. And this was situated right on the corner of um, North Main Street in the street that goes under the underpass. So if you look carefully, you see how it's sloping down. That's the slope under the underpass today. The Smith family, uh, well regarded in this town right up until um, one of the last members, uh, Sandy Freitas, passed away. Um, uh, her children, Tom and Ellen, are still uh, property owners in the town of Harvard. But this chocolate factory was torn down in the 1930s um, because the family's investment and commitment to uh, manufacturing had timed out. Uh, it was replaced by uh, a new generation player with this building that many of you may remember. And um, it's there today. It looks a little grim, if I might say so, because it hasn't had the TLC, but in the day, Fonda's dress shop was one of the most chic dress shops in a 30 mile radius. Um, became the Fucci Law Office because Fonda was Fonda Fucci. And if you look carefully in the basement, you can see they were even able to rent out that lower level. And that was where a little store called Briggs and Phillips began in 1952. So our family story um, <coughs> continued from earlier attempts at business to a little store that started there and ended up in what is now revolution. Um, my own uh, devotion to historic preservation carried on when I found myself living off and on over 15 years in St. Paul, Minnesota, which was a national leader in historic preservation in the 70s. And my wife Sally and I uh, joined a whole generation of preservationists in the uh, Crocus Hill and Historic Hill neighborhoods back behind the St. Paul Cathedral. And I might add just a personal anecdote. Right across the street from this house was a duplex. It backed up to a commercial um, street. So this house was a little more prominent. And we were working away at it. And I would look out the window from that upstairs bedroom window and I could see a, our cat walking across the porch roof of the house across the street. And I asked my wife, well, what's that? She said, oh, he likes to play with that guy's cat. And I said, who is that? She says, well, you listen to, to him every morning on Minnesota Public Radio. It was Garrison Keillor. And he was conceiving the Prairie Home Companion. And out of that, his musical buddy, Butch Thompson, uh, be, and I moved onto this street and we became friends. And when I left that fateful day to come back to um, White River Junction and take over the Coolidge Project, and sort of just out of my back pocket had this notion we could do things in what had been the Gates Opera House, became the Briggs Opera House off the strength that Butch Thompson and the Prairie Home Companion music people all came to White River. And that's what planted the seed for uh, performances in that space. Now, over the years, uh, studying the story of White River Junction, um, I pre made a presentation in 1992 to an elder hostel class. And it stuck as sort of one of the highlights of our curriculum. And for 30 years, uh, I'm proud to say at the Coolidge, we were the leader in Vermont of elder <coughs> hostel, which today you know is Rhodes Scholar, okay, international uh, set of programming. And people would come and stay in the hotel, that was part of my, my plan, uh, by giving them cultural heritage content, taking them on field trips. In the morning, we do a lecture, field trip in the afternoon, and some entertainment at night with people like Willem Lang and Dick McCormick and, and others. And um, so I developed this theory on the story of White River Junction in sort of a general sense. Like, what are the cycles of community? What does a community go through uh, to, on, its, on its journey? And you can s see for yourself if you think this theory holds up. I might add that through my years of Rhodes Scholar, some 10,000 people 
listen to this lecture. And I held their attention uh, pretty well, very well, in fact. Nobody played hooky and nobody fell asleep. <laughs> and, uh, uh, they would come up to me afterwards and say, the people in this town know what you're doing here? And I said, not really. So it's really good when I get my own people in the audience. Let's talk about the theory. It starts way back in 1842. And I'll tell you how I did this. I took all the, the bits and pieces that I had for the story of White River in the form of postcards, mainly gotten from eBay and other things like Johnny St. Croix's book and other resources. Not a particularly scholarly thing, but a mess of stuff. And started putting it into a chronological order. And lo and behold, it seemed to shape up in terms of chapters of the White River experience. And out of that came this theory of how communities age and change. And why was it 1842? Well, I was in the year 1992. And I found that these groupings happened on about a 30-year gap, which is about a generation. So that makes it kind of valid. And if you leapfrog back from 92 in 30-year increments, you come to 1842. That's how scholarly this was. Right? <laughs> but it was just enough before the arrival of the railroads. So you could say that somewhere in there, the notion of railroads and the acquisition of the right-of-ways and all those things, preparations were being done for that first ever moment in 1848. So in that first gap of 30 years, establishing ownership, things like um, the Junction House, which was what the Coolidge used to be called, came along. Um, and then it advances to a period from 1872 to 1902 where it was driven mainly by the power of local ownership, meaning investment, commitment, showing up for work every day and having local control. Inevitably, those kinds of dynamics give way to a transition, the 1902 to 1932 period. And by 1932, we entered a phase of absentee ownership, meaning to say businesses were more likely controlled by outside forces. The primary example would be the Vermont Baking Company of George West, who was also supported, supported by George Smith and his chocolate factory, gave way to the Ward Baking Company of New York City. So all of a sudden, those strategic decisions are being made by people not here. Not of, our, not of our culture. And then, uh, and through those years, or years happened to be where I was trying to grow up. And 1962 was the end of my sophomore year in, in high school. And I would say this about absentee ownership. The people that do the hard work in a community can feel disjointed, out of control, threatened by the change, strategic change of corporate decisions, and doesn't breed a lot of optimism. And um, uh, so just you, you can think about your own experiences and your own observations in, in White River and Hartford over, over the years. Um, so somewhere around 62 to 92 is a reestablishing of local ownership because people like me and others that were new but still committing to be here, like uh, Matt Busey, for example, buying the Tip Top building and doing what he did, and my uh, lifelong friend Byron Hathorne buying the railroad station and advocating for Railroad Row as a local ownership kind of dynamic. And that led us to this period of local ownership from 92 to just two years ago. So when I was advancing this presentation the first time, I was saying, let's see how this works out. And as I tumbled down the years, I was getting ever closer and closer to confirmation. And that brings up the specter of uh, what comes next. And so I put in here the transition to creative economy. White River Junction on our watch, my watch, has gone from a railroad economy to a creative economy. And it just, you can see it every day. I don't think that's <coughs> arguable. It's just a different world. Mm -hmm. David, can you just plug in the dates of the fires in that timeline? The what? The dates of the fires. Cool oh, I'm coming to that. <coughs> yeah, I'll get to that. So establishing ownership shows the original uh, Junction House. This was um, a stagecoach stop out in Enfield that was panelized by Samuel Nutt, 
put on the newfound railroad through Lebanon and trucked into White River Junction for rail, by rail, and reassembled. It's really important and interesting to look up behind in that left-hand corner. Those of us that have been around for a while know that was an active sand and gravel pit. It's all vegetated now. It's hard to imagine, but that's the glacial reality out of which enabled them to build that railroad embankment. They literally clawed down that beautiful sand, that silty sand and whatnot, and made the railroad embankment in front of it. And if you look up behind Stearns, you see the same front end of the glacier, the same thing where they clawed that down for the railroad embankment behind um, Stearns and what used to be Hartford Motors. And this was a very proud building. It, um, it lasted until about 1877 when it, uh, when it burned down. Um, local ownership was evidenced by the arrival of George Smith from Hanover, who brought his, his uh, uh, branded products, which were Dartmouth chocolates and Hanover crackers. He built this beautiful mansard roof brick building. And what stands out, it's, the, it's not boomtown architecture. It's really solid. It's here to stay. And you see the underpass there and the firehouse, now the Main Street Museum behind it. Um, local ownership from 1872 to 1902, I could go into other things. But in 1877, that first junction house burned down. And the new owners, relatively new owners, uh, rebuilt it in a hurry. And this is what came of it, this beautiful Victorian structure. And if you look at it carefully, you can see those steeple towers look reminiscent at least, or ind indicative of the Coolidge Towers that, that are there today. I'll put in a comment about my passion for preservation. When I moved back in 84 to do the Coolidge Project, um, I had the dream that it would be restored to look like this. And when I called the state preservation officer, he said, you can't do that. He said, the 1927 version of the Hotel Coolidge has now been there for 50 plus years, and that is the historic element. You can't reproduce the historic predecessor. Um, let me say something about the owners here. They were chicken farmers from Quiche. Their name was Baron. And uh, Samuel Nutt sold his junction house to them. They became wildly successful. The railroad companies approached them and said, after the Civil War, we're going to start uh, taking tourists into the White Mountains. So the Barron brothers from Queechy, White River, were the ones that built those fabulous destination resorts in the White Mountains, the first generation of them. And they all burned down, too. The only one left is the one at really is the one at Bretton Woods, and they did not build that one. Um, here's another original indicator of local ownership. The White River Paper Company stayed locally owned until just a couple of years ago. The Gates Block was built um, off the initiative of May Gates in 1890, and it included uh, the Gates Opera House, which is now probably the Briggs Opera House. Um, there, uh, uh, impact on the community resulted in uh, what would today would be called a 501c nonprofit, C3 nonprofit, but it was really just the Loyal Club. And they built this wonderful library, which today, of course, is the Good Neighbor Health Center. Um, uh, Frederick Billings influenced White River by moving the Twin State Fair from his backyard at Billings Farm to White River Junction. In 1907, it became the official Vermont State Fair, and it was official for 20 years until it moved to Rutland just after the 27 flood. Um, and I got to tell you this cute story about it. Um, my mother and others told us this story about on the first year of the State Fair um, days, a little old lady asked a Victorian gentleman for water for her horse, and he said no. And she put a hex on the fair, and it started to rain. And it rained all day. And it rained every day of fair week. And it rained every day of every fair week for 20 years. That was the legend. That was in Ripley's Believe It or Not, and all of that. If I have that other postcard in here, I'll tell you the other part of the story. 
Um, Dave, where was that fair? Right on Sykes Sorry. Avenue. Oh, all right. And uh, Nathaniel Wheeler, who was my predecessor at the hotel, um, had his farm up there, which is right on the corner where the Super 8 is, that big sweeping corner. Think about politics and influence. The reason that corner is like that is that Route 5 should have come up from Heartland along the river and up South Main Street. But with Dan Wheeler having his farm there and the state fair on that corner, they drove it up what's called Miller Hill and down through his farmstead, eventually Windsor Brown's farm, and it comes around that sharp corner and that's called Coolidge Corner. So that's the backdrop there. Um, eventually that became an airport um, when the fair moved to Rutland. Uh, Cadillacs by rail, this is Miller Auto's latest shipment in front of the uh, Junction House in about 1910. Um, and we come to the transition of ownership. Um, we talked about the Vermont Baking Company, the Ward Baking Company. Um, still is a lot of civic pride with the State Fair Week. And on the corner of this building, all festooned, the Junction House for Fair Week, is called the Wilson Brothers Drugstore. Here's the Wilson Brothers. I got this picture on eBay, and about three or four years ago, you see the guy standing in the back row? Mm -hmm. His grandson came through the front door, mm -hmm. and he had this picture. I said, I already got it. We had a nice talk about it. Uh, do you all remember Clayt Rice? Clayt mm -hmm. Rice Sr.? Mm -hmm. Well, I had the good sense to sit down with him when he was well into his 90s and ask him a few things. And he told me some choice stories, but the really cool one was um, he worked his first job in the Wilson Brothers drugstore. And one day the door opened and a guy came through the door and he says, hey kid, do you sell water here? And he said, and Clayt said, yes we do. And he said, well, you better stock up because we're coming back and that's what we drink. And he told one of the Wilson brothers that. And the Wilson uh, brothers enjoyed s selling the two cent bottles of water for three cents because they had a captive audience. Who were those people? Well, they were the film crew for Way Down East, the Lillian Gish film, staying uh, in the Junction House. And that's Lillian Gish on the cake of ice there. Um, in 1928, Calvin Coolidge came to Vermont, delivered his famous I Love Vermont speech, and he stopped into White River. Didn't stay at the Coolidge that time, but here he is with Dan Wheeler in front of, uh, front of the, um, in front of the uh, now Hotel Coolidge. Dan Wheeler renamed it from Junction House to Hotel Coolidge in honor of not Calvin Coolidge, but his father, because his father was a frequent traveler. Van Wheeler looks a little bit like W.C. Fields. And one great story about him was a, wait, uh, a lady complained to him and said, one of your waiters has spilled cream on my dress. And Wheeler said, well, that is a lie to begin with. There's no cream in the house. <laughs> I'm just waiting to use that line before I quit. Uh, the Twin State Fair became the Twin State Airport. Uh, Dusty Miller and others advocated for it. Uh, this is a great picture of the woman on the right in this picture is Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you she's not in the White River. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, that airport gave way to the political sway that Lebanon had in World War II. There the, was only going to be one FAA tow control tower in the Upper Valley, mm -hmm. and it went to Lebanon. Entering the scene of absentee ownership the next 30 years, the Depression and the war, and all of that. Most of the people in White River that were left were the people doing the really hard work. And we know that genealogically Irish and Italians dominated. This is a great picture taken from up on the gravel bank looking down in, and this is key to part of the sentiment that we have today with my project, is that you can see that White River is built out. Every space is accounted for. And when you fill it up like that, it's hard to be expansive with your options about what you're going to do next. You have to deal with what you have. You've got to make it fit. Uh, one of the technical terms is called infill. And um, some of those buildings you see in this picture in the 30s uh, went away and they've come back with new construction here and there. Um, and if you can see it a little more closely, you see 
the railroad yards are just chock full of railroad cars. Um, Twin State Fruit on Railroad Row, another indicator of the ethnic um, realities and, and what was going on with the railroad economy. You may recall that picture of the Junction House uh, looking at it when it was first built. But when they first built it, they didn't have the wherewithal to fill in the front yard. And it resulted in a causeway that you walked across to get to the railroad station, and naturally people threw all their litter into the, into the gaps on both sides. Well, with the arrival of civic pride and people that had a vested interest here, the Loyal Club with their library and other things I went forward to create this lovely park. In the age of absentee ownership, it gave way to the ultimate absentee owner, the U.S. government. So in 1934 comes the post office, which became the courthouse, and then today is owned by CCS, Center for Cartoon Studies, locally owned. I'm pushing my theory here. <laughs> Re-establishing local ownership in the, the next 30 years, um, very much a part of, for me as an observer, first as a young youngster, my dad was a select board member in the late 50s. I was telling John Haverstock, have you met our new town manager? Really easy guy to get along with, likable guy. And I said, you know, my dad was a select, mo select board member back in the late 50s. Uh, and he said, oh yeah, how'd that go for him? And he said, well, one of the things that he did was he brought Ralph Lehman to town. But I said the other thing he did was fire the town manager. And John thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> that was a test. Um, so... Uh, Tell a thankless job. <laughs> he knows, too. He's good at it. Um, so up those years, uh, with my involvement here and there, my dad buying the Gates Block in 1972, we restored it in 75, um, and I left for Minnesota in 77 to have another run at being a professional engineer uh, with a big consulting firm, but came back in 84 on the, on the occasion of my 20th reunion from Hartford High. Uh, it's tough to get me out of White River. And here's a scene. My dad's first enterprise before that store was this SO gas station, which is right on this, the land, which is uh, referred to loosely as Fred Briggs Park. And that's him checking the oil in that car there. This is after World War II. The step van that's there in the front is Vermont Cut Flower Exchange, so it's all pretty interesting um, nostalgia pieces. Uh, Friday night lights. You see the lights in the opera house there? That wasn't the opera house at that moment. That was the J.J. Newberry Company upstairs retail function. Um, and then by the late 80s, the Windsor County, County Courthouse uh, took over the spot that for years and years had been the home of Renahan Acres, a lumber yard. And that was sort of an indicator of change. And, um, I was a primary advocate for that, along with the Preservation Trust of Vermont, who really um, uh, were significant in keeping it downtown. It had a chance to go to the Sykes Avenue area because um, the Gilman Complex made the land available for free. And uh, here's a couple of interesting points in terms of the news you hear uh, even today. Um, there were people very much in favor of taking free land on Sykes Avenue. There were others like me who thought it ought to be retained in downtown because it synergizes the human activity. I think I was right on that. I can tell you I enjoy getting the check from the Windsor County State's Attorney's Office, <laughs> among other things. Um, but it was even more holistic than that, just all that, that energy. Well, at the time, the people who were not in favor of that said, well, how do you justify paying $125,000 for land that we could get for free? And what we did was we went to Brattleboro and used the same architectural blueprints that were used in Brattleboro and saved $125,000 in architectural fees um, to justify the site here. Um, once it was done, we were still taking some heat from people that said, well, now you can't get there because it's a 10-foot chain, high 10, chain link fence across the railroad tracks. And 
So how do you get from here to there? And certain vehicles couldn't go through the underpass. Well, Amtrak had been out. They brought it back. They had a, a ceremonial run. Uh, we all got on the train and rode, and we rode north. And as we rode north, my dad and I were seated next to this lady. And we pointed out to her that we were having a hard time getting a railroad crossing approved in White River. And all these towns like Royalton and Randolph, they all had railroad crossings right in the middle of town. Give us a break, right? And we were complaining and expounding on this. And she said, well, I think I'm going to look into that. Who was that lady? Madeline Cunin. So you love Vermont. You sit down, the only seat left is next to the governor. Right? That's not corruption either. Um, in 1985, as I told you, my good friend Butch Thompson came, and we put on a pl uh, concert in, in, uh, in the uh, opera house. Little did we know that the Upper Valley had caught on to the Prairie Home Companion. Today, it seats 240 people. Don't tell the fire marshal. That night we sold 410 seats. And for, for a few days, in my own hometown, I had credibility. Only took about three days for that to go away. And within two years, we had other kinds of activity. And the White River Theater Festival came. And there would be no northern stage without this evolution. The White River Theater Festival opened in the spring of of 1988. We built those risers, eventually put the seats in. You see there it was all sweat equity. And it really gave way to, um, um, to the foundation for Northern Stage. Uh, we called it River City Arts because many of you will recall we had this sort of um, uh, love-hate thing with our hometown. Uh, and by that time, the music man had come out, and River City was the pet town in the, in the play and the musical. And we knew that White River was River City because we got trouble. And we had a pool hall, and the librarian's name was Marion. So we said River City Arts will be sort of our, our call. The two guys that did this came into town one day in 1987 on their way to the Champlain Shakespeare Festival in Burlington. And they came up to uh, Mary in the polka dot. And they said, we want to know where the theater is. And Mary said, I don't know anything about any theater. Well, she was slipping pancakes. She turned around and looked up. She'd be looking right at what today is the Briggs Opera. She said, why don't you go and talk to Dave Briggs? He knows everything. <laughs> now, I love Mary and vice versa, but that was not a compliment. So they came to me and they said, Mary says you know everything. We want to see where Meryl Streep performed. I said, oh, come on and I'll show you something. Well, Meryl Streep had performed for a repertory theater called the Green Mountain Guild. And they eventually came to White River, but not when she was with them. She was with them when she was at Dartmouth. And uh, they had glommed onto that and made sure her name came up in all the literature. But it did its magic, because those two guys, years later, found that name and found me. And in the conversation, they had theater, by the way, at Mount Snow, Killington, and Stowe, sometimes Woodstock and Queechy, and, uh, but never, never could get an Upper Valley footprint. They faded within a couple of years of my arrival. Um, and then these guys came along. And uh, that summer, I said, well, what are you going to do? And they said, well, we're thinking of New York or um, Boston for doing some, some cutting edge theater. They said, well, why don't you do it here? And I didn't hear anything about it until November. And they called me and they said, we've been thinking about what you said. We'd like to give that a try. This is November, right? No contract, no lease, nothing. Just a little dialogue. One day, somewhere out in March, my dad calls me from his office down in what is now Revolution. And he said, hey, there's some noise up there in the theater. And I went up there, and there's a bunch of guys up there painting the ceiling black. I said, oh, that must be those guys that said they were going to do a theater. And it was. So he said, OK, let her rip. So that's how we do business in White River. It became the Briggs Opera House because of their generosity. Uh, naming it in honor of my folks in 1991, which was good because, among other things, my dad only had a year to live at that time, and it was really sweet. Transition of ownership. 
from an industrial economy to a creative economy. Um, the tip-top building done by Matt Busey, rescued, and you've seen the results. Um, the tip-top media art center. His friend David um, Fairbanks Ford uh, with the uh, Main Street Museum. Uh, does anybody know what goes on there? <laughs> I've been there a lot. I, can't, I couldn't explain it to you. But Peggy and I go down there on Friday nights for the player piano concerts. It's pretty fun. Yeah, that's the right word. Uh, Center for Cartoon Studies uh, comes out of a chance dialogue between the founder, James Sturm, whose in-laws live next to Matt Dunn, down in Heartland. And Matt said, why not White River? Just like I had said it to the theater guys. And, um, and the rest is history. Uh, Railroad Row came out of uh, the need for office space. And the office space need was highlighted by the fact that we had created the glory days of the Railroad Festival. Remember how we did that? Mm -hmm. um, every year this, the next week after Labor Day. And um, by the way, it was Peggy that brought artwork to the Railroad Festival and instituted the Zala Koffer Gallery and the hotel out of all that. Um, but what we learned from this was that we couldn't do a railroad museum like Montshire because we didn't have a big enough building. But we could do things that had to do with public policy regarding transportation. And it turned out that the Upper Valley had four major players in transportation policy. And one of them was a Thayer School uh, professor who had started his own transportation planning firm called Resource Systems Group. And they were, by that time, they were in Alcott Park. They had 30 employees, and they were looking to grow. And so over the course of the next two years, uh, they made their commitment to grow. And uh, this building was built by Bill Bittinger on Railroad Row. Uh, Tom Adler brought his now 75-person firm and moved into it. Um, and within a couple of years, they hired um, a new Tuck grad whose name was Clay Adams. Clay went from CEO of RSG to the CEO of Simon Pierce, and today he's the president of Mascoma Bank. Mm -hmm. Interesting backstory, and a fabulous guy to work with. Um, Matt Busey was at it again when the Legion uh, timed out, and this building needed to be uh, um, have an adaptive reuse. Has anybody seen these units mm -hmm. in the Legion? Yeah. There's 22 of them. Their efficiencies. The ceilings are 12 feet high, and you sleep on top of the bathroom. So can you imagine me three times a night down those la that ladder? <laughs> it's not for everybody. Now, Northern Stage grew out of the White River Theater Festival evolution, disjointed in a way. The two guys that were there, along with the rest of us, grew that enterprise to a million dollar a year budget, and it failed. And it failed because we were working off the wrong economic model. Today, Northern Stage, who, le who learned it only in the third year of its existence, it almost failed. Brooke will tell you that. Um, we went into a great think tank over at the uh, Fireside Inn with about 70 of us. And out of that came the realization that a theater company runs 50% at the box office and 50% from philanthropy. And that's why they give you that pitch every time because they need those funds to make it work. Once that came into full focus and put a few years under their belt, the 17th year of Northern Stage, we were able to buy the Miller Auto Complex and retrofit it in one side and redevelop it on the other. And you've seen it happen. So the Barrett Center came out of that. Um, the backstory on that was that it was brokered uh, with the help of Bill Miller um, myself, Byron Hathorne, and Peggy. And I always call her the secret weapon because uh, Bill Miller had become ever more intrigued with what was going on in town. He could see the evolution even in the car business. He moved Miller Auto to Lebanon. And um, he would open his mail every day in the Coolidge Cafe. And Peggy would plunk down next to him and be friendly and I was a fellow Rotarian. We got to know each other on a real one-to-one -one basis. And finally, one day, I had the courage to say, would you like to sell Miller Auto? He said, yeah, we would. 
and he gave a reasonable price. He wasn't trying to profiteer off it. And Byron Hathorne and I stepped up and bought it from him. Northern Stage then was brought in to take it over. We sold it to them at cost, essentially. And uh, we got some of the planning dollars back in that cost. And we um, kept a funny little piece of land next to the Methodist Church that became this. And we advocated for tax increment financing um, successfully. There was a lot of pushback, a lot of doubts. But here's the story of the village. This building, um, as you know, is a really high-end um, assisted care living with memory units. It's not unaffordable. It's the same price as all the other Valley Terrace, Wheelock Terrace, Woodstock Terrace, all the same pricing, but it's just lovely. And it's built around the arts and performance um, workshops there. They haven't really pulled that together yet because COVID knocked it down. It hasn't become user friendly <coughs> at that level. But here's what matters to Hartford taxpayers. The last year we owned that little piece of land, we paid the town of Hartford $2,500. That piece of land this year will pay the town of Hartford in excess of $500,000. And as you painfully know, taxes are forever. That is a win. That's the case for Hartford to think of itself as being in the economic development game, especially when we have a built up area, commercial district such as downtown White River, as many rural Vermont villages don't have. Um, along the heels of all of this came innovations like Newberry Market, which as of last year came to full maturity by the expansion of Tucker Box and um, the expansion of uh, Junction Arts Media. Uh, we shifted from doing a vague farmer's market scenario to the Jam Studios, which is now in a joint venture with the uh, Shaker Bridge Theater to uh, run, operate. The Briggs Opera House is a community arts center. So mission accomplished. And you may know that the Tucker Box people have leapt over into the other side with their Cappadocia Cafe, which is Turkish pizza. Does anybody know what it looks like? Well, it's not a, it's not a pie. It's a baguette. It's not made from sourdough. It's from flaky stuff like phyllo dough. And it's filled with all those Mediterranean goodies. And you slice it off and you pull us. Morning, <laughs> <laughs> A couple days from now, I will. I've been waiting five months to get the immigration approved on the Turkish chefs. Finally did it. Uh, Mike Davidson filled in an empty lot next to cover with 69 studio units. Um, it's a little shocking as to what new construction costs mean in terms of rent. Um, and you can talk about that. Um, there's a, the other view of his building from, from south looking north. And so revisiting the cycles of community as I presented them to you. <clears throat> now, Lanny, to your interest in the three buildings, we'll go over that again. Um, from 1849 to 2024, uh, Colonel Nutt's first project was to move in that stagecoach stop that lasted until 1877. It sold it to the barons of Queechy, and they turned it into uh, th this beautiful um, um, Victorian hotel. And if you look behind this building, there's about 100 cords of wood back there. That's how they heated it. This is, again, another shot from that um, sandbank. There's the, um, the junction house all done. And here is uh, a shot before 1890 with that causeway I talked about and the resulting Loyal Club Park that came along through Civic Pride. Um, this is the Coolidge Block in 2024, and you can see it looks a little bit like the shape of the original uh, Junction House, pictures from both ends. And so now I want to talk about the case for redevelopment. Why would I come to this conclusion? Well. It has to do with the fact that, um, first of all, I would point out that I happen to find myself in a unique place in the history of the downtown area where I'm the controlling factor in terms of management of both the Gates block and the Coolidge block. 
The Gates block is owned by the Gates Briggs Building Trust, which is my mother's estate played out through my uh, sister and sister-in-law and myself. And the Coolidge block is owned by an investment partnership that I formed in 1984. And I did it by selling uh, shares that are called limited partnership units. And I sold them pretty much to locals. And um, I'm the worst salesman. I don't even want to sell you a raffle ticket. It killed me to sell 57 investment units in the fall of 1984. You talk about determination. Um, but the Northern Hospitality Limited Partnership has me as its general partner, and I'm autonomous. Uh, the only way they could get rid of me would be if I did something really illegal. And so far, I've avoided that. Um, so why is that important? Well, if you were going to try to do a complicated set of transactions, it's pretty nice to only have one guy to go to who can balance off. And every day, it's a blended existence where I can say to somebody in one building, you can come here and stay, you can go there and stay, and we make it all work. Right? Um, the other day I walked into the junction room, our nice big dining room, and the guy that paints the lampshades, Ken Blaisdell, is on the floor in the dark doing his PT exercises. <laughs> Didn't have to ask. Um, so the historic role of the Coolidge site is one of prominence. It's really been a dominant place. Um, however, the structural condition of the building and the shape of the building doesn't cover the entire site. And to bring new investment into it in the shape of the building makes it difficult to impossible. I can't attract that kind of investment. I would have to sell it in the as-is condition to somebody that looks about like me. And they would go through the agony of growing through the years that I have. And I've not now done 40 years, four decades. Nobody's going to do that. I don't deserve a medal for that. It just happens to be the way it turned out. I'm submitting to you that people are not likely to do that again. And if they did, they would have to live with a building that I can tell you has a lot of challenges. And to get that kind of um, new money into it just seemed too daunting. So when you consider the needs for housing and potentially hospitality, it just calls for a new building that preserves the prominence of the site only under modern conditions, not the least of which is energy efficiency. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it represents infill development in the central business district on the bus line, and at a scale it's required to have professional management. The days of Peggy and I doing this are over at that level. Um, I mean, if we were fabulously wealthy, we could do it, but fabulously wealthy people don't tend to do what we've done. So that's the case. I had to take this to the Preservation Trust of Vermont. You must imagine how comfortable that was. And I did it again in the context of the two buildings. I said we can preserve one building, the Gates Block, and hope to preserve the use of it as a cultural center, the Briggs Opera House. But what I'd like to preserve is the prominence of the Hotel Coolidge site by making sure we have a building that can go into the future. And so, uh, I wrote the 20-page case study, gave it to them 10 years ago. This isn't an overnight idea. And if any of you want to see that, you have to call me up. You don't have to take me to lunch. I'll just make it available to you. Um, we've had the property surveyed so that um, interested parties can size it up. And this is the survey of both the sites. You can see the Coolidge block on the left shows quite a bit of space unused on the land. A new building would cover it all. Uh, the the pre-development efforts have called that case study, preserving a sense of place, a massing study by the same architects that did the village, a construction cost estimate that was done pro bono by one of the biggest builders in Boston um, because of his excitement for the vision. Uh, property survey and soil borings, engineering evaluations, environmental conditions were pretty clean. 
we have lead paint and asbestos of the usual um, category, but we don't have dry cleaning fluid or other toxic waste. And the soils under the Coolidge are just as fabulous as they are when they built the railroads there. There's no water table till 40 feet deep. Where was the Powers building in that? I didn't, you know, the Powers building's like right in the middle of here. You can see it Coolidge. if you look carefully right, okay. right there. Yeah. Okay. The Powers building. And that's going to remain, right? I mean, well, I don't control it. But I can tell you that whenever I talk to the development community, and I do, um, they always ask about that because they would master plan the whole block, maybe. So those are some of the arguing points, the property survey. Um, oops, I'm going backwards. Um, the pre-development efforts that I've made. This has gone out as um, a presentation to maybe 50 development companies around New England. Uh, the potential for the site is a five-story building as opposed to three, covering the full lot. The potential for 100 underground parking spaces. When we get to q and I'll give you some exciting new thoughts to think about. A mixed-use commercial, residential, and maybe hospitality. And I say that because it's not a slam dunk that the hotel industry can make hotel rooms work there. They could if you'd want to pay $450 a night. But I think it's sort of antithetical to the funk factor of White River to have that kind of a challenge. Um, chance for storm sewer, uh, sewerage separation, state-of-the-art energy efficiency, tax base enhancement. Like today, I will pay about $50,000 in taxes on the building. Um, and as you know, a, build, a project of this magnitude is going to pay several hundred thousand dollars. And even after it gets a concession from the town of Hartford in the early years, it's still hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not 50. And the impact of all this on the downtown is what I call business stabilization. Have to go through a painful 18-month period when it's pretty chaotic to go through this. Um, here's what the architectural firm from Denver did, the same one that designed the village, uh, to conceptualize uh, what a site of this size might do with a five-story building. And I've got 18 slides of this that take you through the building one floor at a time. It's all computer-aided design. It's pretty exciting to see. But it gives you something to talk about. Specific uses. Commercial on the first floor would include preservation of what I call the artisan tenants, like the lampshade, the flower uh, place, junction frame, stores like that. Um, I've talked to um, Mount Sunapee about the notion of expanding their rehab clinic to White River Junction as an example of a high grade first floor use. The new first floor, instead of 11,000 square feet, would have 22,000 square feet. Um, and that the hospitality piece might be an expanded hotel event center. Instead of a 120-seat dining room, it'd have a 250-seat dining room mm -hmm. and meeting facilities that would rival Lake Morien, as an example. A workforce housing, market rate rental housing, because you want those taxes, and municipal underground parking. The radical idea that Hartford might have to be in the parking business for this to work. And that's called site prep. If, if the, through a municipal uh, venture, would purchase the building in the as-is condition, tear it down, dispose of it, and build the underground parking as a platform, the development community can merge its efforts and its investment onto that site. Lots of complicated discussions coming on that. Um, the benefits to the town of Hartford are tax base contribution, housing stock, energy. We're now talking about um, advancing to geothermal heating of some variation that could be applied to the new building, but also be set up as a district where existing buildings could be funded for retrofit from their current envelope to something that would justify geothermal 
technology in it. It's, ex it's expansive and it's complicated and uh, we're in the earliest stages of it. The first feasibility effort is being done by the famous Oak Ridge Laboratories. Um, Jesse, are they in Tennessee? Yeah. They're doing a, a, the first ever feasibility study on the conditions in Hartford, White River Junction to see if this might apply. Um, and it would c call for us going on bended knee to the congressional delegation to get special uh, sympathetic support. Uh, downtown would serve as an economic multiplier, add to the housing stock. Uh, my own selfish interest is a return on investment. Frankly, this is my path to retirement. Mm -hmm. And um, my son will, would have told you five years ago I should have bailed out and listed it and moved on. And I just don't want to do that. I think this is too cool. This is the time of my life when I'm still fit enough to advocate for it and do it. Um, and now I'm too old to quit. <laughs> uh, confirmation of a legacy, you might say. What, what a, how cool would it be for me to look back and say this is where we started and this is where we ended up. So those are drivers for me. Right? <clears throat> and uh, I like it here. So, Project timeline realities. The developer selection was targeted the summer of 2024. Um, I'm meeting tomorrow. Uh, in about the seventh meeting of the developer that I think might be the final choice from the Boston area. Um, discussions with that developer in the town of Hartford will start to happen this fall. The town is starting to draft a, a policy uh, document that enables, the, in this case, the landowner, the developer, and the town to work together for common goals. Obviously, tax base enhancement, resolution of a key property to the town, um, resolving my situation into the next generation, and something attractive enough to the development community to make a massive um, investment. The equity placement on this would probably be $25 million to make it work. The heating district concept, the submittals and all of that stuff, I just threw these dates down there. This is so ambitious as to be laughable. Um, the only thing that I can tell you that gives me any anxiety is that I just want to live long enough to see it happen. Uh, but any stretch of the imagination, you could imagine uh, everything falling into place maybe by early 2027. That already looks like middle of 27 at the best. It's, you can feel it slipping, right? Every day it's slipping. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't keep trying. You've got to have something to pull for. So that's the history. That's a big part of my story. It's a big part of your story. Um, it's me putting it all out there for you to reflect on. And so I would say, first of all, thanks for coming and listening. And. Um, you have survived another Dave Briggs presentation. <laughs> I would open it up to Q&A uh, for as long as you want to stay. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Can briefly go back to that map for us and, and kind of make sure we know what's what on that map. Property can survey. You, um, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you sh kind of show us can what's what there, orientate us? Okay. That would be helpful. Thank you. The Coolidge block is a U-shaped building, or a J-shaped building. Can you pick up on those dimensions? Yeah. Yes. This is Northern Stage. This is the Center for Cartoon Studies. This is Fred Briggs Park. Let me tell you another thing. The night that Madeline Cunin said she would help us with the crossing. We got it in about six months, no public hearings, no fuss, never heard about the cost of it, nothing, just got done. It's scary that government can do that. <laughs> anyway, the resulting road across the tracks is Joe Reed Drive. He had something to do. In the early 50s, Joe Reed was a retailer along with my dad and he had a Firestone store right next to where Fonda's was. 
And they were great buddies, social friends. We had lots of good times together. Years later, when Joe became a select board member, uh, he was a little bummed out about the doubtful state of the economy, and he got kind of negative. It wasn't so much fun to be with. Um, but we were, we were sort of joined socially that way, and uh, my dad would grind his teeth over what Joe was doing next, right? And it just makes me laugh when I see the plaque to my dad, a little sign that says, Joe Reed Drive. They're up there somewhere laughing it off. Okay, I forgot to identify myself. I'm, I'm Gwen Tucson. I'm the, the wife of Leonard Morse. I think you know Leonard Morse. Oh, yes, of course yeah, I yeah, do. Okay, yeah. so when you say filling out the block, you're filling out basically this, the half on this side. T th this project is about redeveloping, tearing down the Coolidge building and preserving the Gates block. Right, so it's just this half just of that. Just this side. Okay, right. all right. Yeah. And then as uh, Phil pointed out, that's the original Powers building. <laughs> So I had a couple follow-up questions for you. The geothermal project, this is, this is kind of new, so you wouldn't necessarily know the answer yet, but you're potentially, if this all works out, you could potentially have geothermal power that could apply to nearby buildings. Is that that's what you're the saying? idea. Okay, that's, that's okay. Yeah. And then, so the, the, the other question is, thinking of underground parking, the first thing I think about is this is a place that has lots of floods. Okay, I've got a little background in this because my original professional path was as a civil engineer and worked for the Corps of Engineers in floodplain management and things like that and the other observations we can make. The 1927 flood came up just about the first floor of Town Hall. That's about six or eight feet below Main Street in downtown White River. The the 27 flood never got into downtown White River. Now that, you've heard reference to the 100 year flood. The 1927 wasn't the 100 year flood. It was the 250 year flood. It was like biblical. So uh, it's not a flood prone area. Wait, wait a minute, I, I, I want to check. Flood, I think the 36 flood was higher. higher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it, I look at the pictures, I see flood after flood after flood. After I, don't, flood I don't think you'll see anything that filled the underpass. Oh. Do you know? All I know is that the 36 flood came about seven, eight, nine feet up the side of the municipal building. They had a mark on it. That's correct. I've seen those pictures. But that's still, that's still about eight feet below Main Street level okay. across okay. the way. Okay. And I had to check the 100-year flood somewhere in the 1970s for what I can't remember. Um, but I was astounded at what happened. And it happened on the White River. It didn't happen on the Connecticut yeah, River. It's on the White River. And I, don't, I, I can't remember how... What, what happened to you? <coughs> I can't remember that one now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They, they measure the, the flow in rivers in units, cubic feet okay. per second, right? And the typical daily flow in the White River is about 1,500, right? And the daily flow in the Connecticut River is about 12,000. So in the 27 flood, the Connecticut River went from 12,000 to 35,000. So then I turned the page from the data book I was in to see what was the flow on the White River. Remember I said typically 1,200. At the peak of the 27 flood, it was 250,000. It's crazy. Yeah. Conditions in the White River Valley were different because there was no trees. Yeah. Linda. So it's Linda Miller. So um, what I lament is that downtown White River has no green space. And I wondered, is there any plan to put any kind of a, of a park or anything? Because that would be wonderful if there were. Well, I'm not being told everything because sometimes internally things are in flux. So I'll give them that kind of a pass. But the plans for this park across from the Newberry Market space were a lot greener than what's happened so far. So there's a little bit of softening there. But there really isn't any space for it. And uh, I think the urbanness of White River is somehow we've made it play to our advantage. It's not like Coburn Park in Lebanon and probably never will be. 
Uh, my dream piece is the little piece that goes out behind the courthouse and into the White River in uh, Connecticut. But you got to get down there. The Veterans Park is there on that side too, so that's kind of That's nice. very nice, yeah. I've had the, my, my dream scenarios is to push what you know as a cow pass, you know how they have under railroad tracks, right by the courthouse so it would dump out onto that little piece that goes out onto the Connecticut, the point there. Mm -hmm. And of course we, as a bicentennial project, we're the ones, I was on the committee in 76, we brought Lyman Point Park into being. So, you know, we've worked at those things. But I think it's kind of okay for it to be kind of hard and gritty down there, as long as it's clean and friendly. That's small. Phil. Uh, it's Phil Sargent. Um, you touched a little bit on the, the um, Vermont Welcome Center that, you know, Byron had bought the old train station. I was part of the development of that with my photography and stuff. Um, the, just this last summer I was in there and it, appears to not be the Welcome Center anymore. It it's been like gone for quite some time. The strategies in government seem to change just like the theories in education. About the time you think you might have it figured out or you're settled in, they change it and then you got to start arguing all over again. So the way of managing tourism flipped on us. And uh, it flipped at that time from interstate to in town. Montpelier was the first and we were among the earliest players in that, and we worked hard to get it there, but it, it just timed out. I don't, I wasn't, you, you lose attention after a while. When you do something, it gets up and running, you turn to other things, and then all of a sudden it's changed. You know, and you talked about the lack of space in the downtown, but um, there's, there's a lot of the, there's a lot of the um, train property that doesn't appear to be used as much anymore, especially over towards West Lebanon. And you know, one of the things I thought is Lebanon is developing their, their bike trails immensely. You know, the plan I was told is they're gonna develop, you know, the West Lebanon rail yard into a park and then continue the trail up to meet Boston lot and then make a big loop. And I just wondered if, if you know of any, um, anything in the works for us to get passage across the railroad bridge from West Lebanon to White River Junction. I don't know about the bridge, but it's an obvious element that should be looked at. Mm. I do know that Byron Hathorne spent a lot of time with the town and others conceiving of the potential for um, surface parking mm -hmm. in the Y. Yeah. And there's a significant potential there, but they never push past the right-of-way and liability challenges that the railroad places in front of it. But go back to that faithful day with Madeline Kuhn and helped us with the railroad crossing. Mm -hmm. The right players can sometimes make the difference. Got a mic coming your way. Oh, I don't need a mic. Do you, it's got to go on, the, it wants to go on the tape. Thank you. Yeah. No room to hide. Is this going to be a brick building? Don't know. Don't know. All right. You've I, seen what's happened with new buildings in right, the last 10 years. Right, and I'm not a fan. Yeah. So um, I would like it, some preservation to um, have it look not quite so modern as what's going in. I will declare victory if I can get the investment in the development of a quality building as a result, but it becomes quickly not my play anymore. This will take on a life of its own. It's already feeling like that. You kind of have to let go. And uh, I can advocate along with you, but I, uh, the, it's really tenuous, the economics of this. They have to be really imaginative. And recently, um, I was reminded of a forum of engineers and architects that happens of all places in the Salt Hill pub on Thursday afternoon, so it's easy choice to go. And um, most recently, we had um, a manufacturer talking to us about um, what's called laminated timber structures and more and more significant buildings to well beyond five stories high are being built out of timber. And then the facade treatments typically can be uh, either um, metal or brick veneer or just the timber itself. So it's beyond me. David, what's the relationship? 
<laughs> I'm Scott Fletcher. And I'm wondering about the relationship between the developer and the management of the new project. If, if it's the same entity that's going to develop and manage this thing. And I'm thinking about, you know, the possibility of getting like a major anchor kind of tenant in there. How would that evolve? Well, first of all, it's the developer's challenge to have rent paying tenants at the right level. So they're motivated to have anchor tenants and all of that. And again, it gets it gets beyond me. I get I learn a lot from uh, mixing it up with these people, but I I don't know exactly what makes them go one way or another. My focus is on uh, reputable firms that have the sense of quality and are going to bring a quality, durable, sustainable building in general, and not get into the weeds on the details. <coughs> Hope that wasn't too evasive an answer. Hi, um, Nancy. I just had a question about who's in that building right now, the one that you're going to be tearing down. Are people, are those rooms that are rented, <coughs> will people be, you know, yes. out yes. with this? How let, many? Me let me talk to that. Okay. Um, the Coolidge when it opened in 1927, boasted 160 rooms. Today there are 56. Where did those rooms go? Bathrooms, okay? So we have 31 guest rooms and 25 monthly rentals, okay? They're not like conventional hotel rooms, but if you rent one of those, you get a, a small room with a private bath, access to a common area kitchen. Everything's covered in your rent in terms of Wi-Fi, utilities. Uh, we even uh, give you clean sheets every week. Wow. Right? It's a monthly, month to month deal. We are candidly very judicious about who gets those rooms. <laughs> if we had done the voucher program during COVID, it would have just killed that building. Yeah. Uh, but we had a big head start on it uh, because of the um, master's programs at Dartmouth and the traveling nurses' needs for it. We instituted ourselves with them about 25 years ago, and that's what stabilized us. Try to be a 56-room hotel, we became a 31-room hotel. And uh, I'm really... It's a poignant reality about giving up the hotel thing because after all these years, the last five years we've been rated number one on TripAdvisor for White River. We represent 30 rooms out of 600 rooms on that interchange, and we're number one. <coughs> and we're proud of that. But it's because of very careful management of that. Now, what happens when the redevelopment comes? The people that well, first of all, if there's any public money involved, there's some really strict protocols. You can't just kick people out. You know how tough it is to evict somebody, even when they're in the wrong. So it's really challenging, and the developer knows that. Um, the main floor commercial tenants, not so tough. Um, but I referenced what I call artisan tenants, the ones we've incubated. They're treasures. And... Um, they can afford new construction price if they winnow down how many square feet they have. Some of them have 1,000 square feet and they only need 600. So they can pay more rent and get less space and still perform. So finessing them in to the middle. So the theme right now is an event center, artists and tenants like there are now in a medical services clinic. That's the game plan. So like an urgent care, you mean? No, I talked to Mount about their rehab center, because so many of us go there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a growing thing. They were, uh, you know, I've had the door slammed on me more than once. That one stayed open. Yeah. Lady, I'm going to give you three minutes. <laughs> it's not my rule now. So, David, I think the big question that has come before me as a select board member, and I think is on the minds of a lot of people in town of Hartford, is 
And I know it's it's kind of uh, I don't want to say a glass ball uh, question, but uh, what sort of a payback period is there to the town of Hartford if we were to take on this project for the taxpayers and looking at the return on investment? I mean, we're talking about a considerable amount of money to do the work on this project and um, paying for you know for parking underneath the Coolidge block. Um, just the return for the taxpayers would be the big question, I guess. Because anything like this would, of course, have to go for a bond within the town. Well, I'm glad that you answered that, asked that question because that's really a pivotal item, right? This is my hometown, too. So I would not advocate that the town go blindly into this. And I think this is such a sophisticated undertaking at both uh, state and federal level sources. Uh, this thing is going to be put under the microscope 10 ways to Sunday, and the developer's right in there with it. So everybody knows everything about it. Um, I think that Hartford is going to have to angle and hope for support from the state and federal levels at, um, to a significant degree. It can't be carried on the shoulders of the people of Hartford. On the one hand, but then when you look at a pro forma that says, well, today you get $50,000 a year in taxes and you're in the long term looking at several hundred thousand dollars a year in taxes, you can probably retire a few bonds off that. So that validity will get worked out in the numbers. It should be totally transparent, um, but it's critically dependent on it. In fact, you may recall. Um, I was encouraged by the state to apply for a transportation infrastructure grant through an agency called the Northern Borders Regional Commission two years ago now. And um, that program would bring Hartford $3 million, but it would only bring it if Hartford would match it with $3 million of bonded indebtedness. So it's that kind of measurement that we'd have to square up to. Right? So that's a little bit of the answer to it. Um, you also have to weigh in on the multiplier effect of both neighboring properties tax base and the impact on local business. So that gets complicated. But I think the, the numbers that the development community will use and use it in uh, collaboration with the town will make that all very clear. So you won't be vulnerable as a select board member of not knowing exactly how that works. I won't because I doubt I'll be on the board that way. <laughs> You'll find a way to know though and I'll help you. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Okay, well thank you so much for being here and thank you for David. <laughs>